Mac. Usually Mac leaves after the last show, but tonight he is in his office working late. When he's done, he stops by my domain and stares at me for a long time while he drinks from a brown bottle. George joins him, broom in hand, and Mac says the thing he always says. How about that game last night? And business has been slow, but it'll get better. You'll see. And don't forget to empty the trash. Mac glances over at the picture Julia is drawing. What are you making? He asks. It's for my mom, Julia says. It's a flying dog. She holds up her drawing, eyeing it critically. She likes airplanes and dogs. Hmm, Mac murmurs, sounding unconvinced. He looks at George. How's the wife doing, anyway? About the same, George says. She has good days and bad days. Yeah, don't we all, Mac says. Mac starts to leave, then pauses. He reaches into his pocket, pulls out a crumpled green bill, and presses it into George's hand. Here, Mac says with a shrug. Buy the kids more crayons. Mac is already out the door before George can yell, thanks. Not sleepy. Stella, I say, after Julia and her father go home, I can't sleep. Of course you can, she says. You are the king of sleepers. Shh, Bob says from his perch on my belly. I'm dreaming about chili fries. I'm tired, I say, but I'm not sleepy. What are you tired of? Stella asks. I think for a while. It's hard to put into words. Gorillas are not complainers. We're dreamers, poets, philosophers, nap takers. I don't know exactly. I kick at my tire swing. I think I may be a little tired of my domain. That's because it's a cage, Bob tells me. Bob is not always tactful. I know, Stella says. It's a very small domain. And you're a very big gorilla, Bob adds. Stella, I ask. Yes? I noticed you were limping more than usual today. Is your leg bothering you? Just a little, Stella answers. I sigh. Bob resettles. His ears flick. He drools a bit, but I don't mind. I'm used to it. Try eating something, Stella says. That always makes you happy. I eat an old brown carrot. It doesn't help, but I don't tell Stella. She needs to sleep. You could try remembering a good day, Stella suggests. That's what I do when I can't sleep. Stella remembers every moment since she was born. Every scent, every sunset, every slight, every victory. You know I can't remember much, I say. There's a difference, Stella says gently, between can't remember and won't remember. That's true, I admit. Not remembering can be difficult, but I've had a lot of time to work on it. Poby. Memories are precious, Stella adds. They help tell us who we are. Try remembering all your keepers. You always liked Carl, the one with the harmonica. Carl. Yes. I remember how he gave me a coconut when I was still a juvenile. It took me all day to open it. I try to recall other keepers I have known. The humans who cleaned my domain and prepared my food and sometimes kept me company. There was Juan, who poured Pepsis into my waiting mouth, and Katrina, who used to poke me with a broom when I was sleeping, and Ellen, who sang, How much is that monkey in the window, with a sad smile while she scrubbed my water bowl. And there was Gerald, who once brought me a box of fat, sweet strawberries. Gerald was my favorite keeper. I haven't had a real keeper in a long time. Max says he doesn't have the money to pay for an ape babysitter. These days, George cleans my cage, and Mac is the one who feeds me. 
When I think about all the people who have taken care of me, mostly it's Mac, I recall, day in and day out, year after year after year. Mac, who bought me and raised me and says I'm no longer cute. As if a silverback could ever be cute. Moonlight falls on the frozen carousel, on the silent popcorn stand, on the stall of leather belts that smell like long-gone cows. The heavy work of Stella's breathing sounds like the wind in trees, and I wait for sleep to find me. The Beetle Mac gives me a new black crayon and a fresh pile of paper. It's time to work again. I smell the crayon, roll it in my hands, press the sharp point against my palm. There's nothing I love more than a new crayon. I search my domain for something to draw. What is black? An old banana peel would work, but I've eaten them all. Not tag is brown. My little pool, my little pool is blue. The yogurt raisin I'm saving for this afternoon is white, at least on the outside. Something moves in the corner. I have a visitor. A shiny beetle has stopped by. Bugs often wander through my domain on their way to somewhere else. Hello, beetle, I say. He freezes, silent. Bugs never want to chat. The beetle's an attractive bug with a body like a glossy nut. He's black as a starless night. That's it. I'll draw him. It's hard making a picture of something new. I don't get the chance that often. But I try. I look at the beetle, who's being kind enough not to move, then back at my paper. I draw his body, his legs, his little antenna, his sour expression. I'm lucky. The beetle stays all day. Usually bugs don't linger when they visit. I'm beginning to wonder if he's feeling all right. Bob, who's been known to munch on bugs from time to time, offers to eat him. I tell Bob that won't be necessary. I'm just finishing my last picture when Mac returns. George and Julia are with him. Mac enters my domain and picks up a drawing. What the heck is this? He asks. Beats me what Ivan thinks he's drawn. This is a picture of nothing. A big black nothing. Julia is standing just outside my domain. Can I see? She asks. Mac holds my picture up to the window. Julia tilts her head. She squeezes one eye shut. Then she opens her eye and scans my domain. I know, she exclaims. It's a beetle. See that beetle over there by Ivan's pool? Man, I just sprayed this place for bugs. Mac walks over to that beetle and lifts his foot. Before Mac can stomp, the beetle skitters away, disappearing through a crack in the wall. Mac turns back to my drawings. So you figure this is a beetle, huh? If you say so, kid. Oh, that's a beetle for sure, Julia says, smiling at me. I know a beetle when I see one. It's nice, I think, having a fellow artist around. Change. Stella is the first to notice the change, but soon we all feel it. A new animal is coming to the Big Top Mall. How do we know this? Because we listen, we watch, and most of all, we sniff the air. Humans always smell odd when change is in the air. Like rotten meat with a hint of papaya. Guessing. Bob fears our new neighbor will be a giant cat with slitted eyes and a coiled tail. But Stella says a truck will arrive this afternoon carrying a baby elephant. How do you know? I ask. I sample the air, but all I smell is caramel corn. I love caramel corn. I can hear her, Stella says. She's crying for her mother. I listen. I hear the cars charging past. I hear the snore of the sun bears in their wire domain. But I don't hear any elephants. You're just hoping, I say. Stella closes her eyes. No, she says softly. Not hoping. Not at all. Jambo. My TV is off, so while we wait for the new neighbor, I ask Stella to tell us a story. Stella rubs her right front foot against the wall. 
Her foot is swollen again, an ugly, deep red. If you're not feeling well, Stella, I say, you could take a nap and tell us a story later. I'm fine, she says, and she carefully shifts her weight. Tell us the Jambo story, I say. It's a favorite of mine, but I don't think Bob has ever heard it. Because she remembers everything, Stella knows many stories. I like colorful tales with black beginnings and stormy middles and cloudless blue sky endings. But any story will do. I'm not in a position to be picky. Once upon a time, Stella begins, there was a human boy. He was visiting a gorilla family at a place called a zoo. What's a zoo? Bob asks. He's a street smart dog, but there's much he hasn't seen. A good zoo, Stella says, is a large domain, a wild cage, a safe place to be. It has room to roam and humans who don't hurt. She pauses, considering her words. A good zoo is how humans make amends. Stella moves a bit, groaning softly. The boy stood on a wall, she continues, watching, pointing, but he lost his balance and fell into the wild cage. Humans are clumsy, I interrupt. If only they would knuckle walk, they wouldn't topple so often. Stella nods. A good point, Ivan. In any case, the boy lay in a motionless heap while the humans gasped and cried. The silverback, whose name was Jambo, examined the boy as was his duty while his troop watched from a safe distance. Jambo stroked the boy, choked the child gently. He smelled the boy's pain, and then he stood watch. When the boy awoke, his humans cried out, Stay still! Don't move! Because they were certain, humans are always certain about things, that Jambo would crush the boy's life from him. The boy moaned. The crowd waited, hushed, expecting the worst. Jambo led his troop away. Men came down on ropes and whisked the child to waiting arms. Was the boy all right? Bob asks. He wasn't hurt, Stella says, although I wouldn't be surprised if his parents hugged him many times that night in between their scoldings. Bob, who has been chewing on his tail, pauses, tilting his head. Is that a true story? I always tell the truth, Stella replies, although I sometimes confuse the facts. Lucky. I've heard the Jambo story many times. Stella says that humans found it odd that the huge silverback didn't kill the boy. Why, I wonder, was that so surprising? The boy was young, scared, alone. He was, after all, just another great ape. Bob nudges me with his cold nose. Avin, he says, why aren't you and Stella in a zoo? I look at Stella. She looks at me. She smiles sadly with her eyes, just a little, the way only elephants can do. Just lucky, I guess, she says. Arrival. The new neighbor arrives after the four o'clock show. When the truck comes lumbering toward the parking lot, Bob scampers over to inform us. Bob always knows what's happening. He's a useful friend to have, especially when you can't leave your domain. With a groan, Mac lifts the sliding metal door near the food court, the place where deliveries are made. A big white truck is backing up to the door, belching smoke. When the driver opens the truck, I know that Stella is right. A baby elephant is inside. I see her trunk poking out from the blackness. I'm glad for Stella, but when I glance at her, I see she is not glad at all. Stand back, everyone, Mac yells. We got a new arrival. This is Ruby, folks. 600 pounds of fun to save our sorry butts. This gal's gonna sell us some tickets. Mac and two men climb into the black cave of the truck. We hear noise, scuffling, a word Mac uses when he's angry. 
Ruby makes a noise too, like one of the little trumpets they sell at the gift store. Move, Max says, but still, there is no Ruby. Move, he says again. We haven't got all day. Inside her domain, Stella paces as much as she's able. Two steps one way, two steps the other. She slaps her trunk against rusty metal bars. She grumbles. Stella, I ask. Did you hear the baby? Stella mutters something under her breath, a word she uses when she's angry. Relax, Stella, I say. It'll be okay. Ivan, Stella says, it will never, ever be okay. And I know enough to stop talking. Stella helps. The men are still yelling. Some of them, some of the yelling is at each other, but most of it is at Ruby. We hear scrambling, pounding, shifting. The side of the truck shudders. I'm starting to like this elephant, Bob whispers. I'm getting the big one, Mac says. Maybe she can coax the stupid brat out of the truck. Mac opens Stella's door. Come on, girl, he urges. He unties the rope attached to the floor bolt. Stella pushes past Mac, nearly knocking him over. She rushes as best she can, limping heavily, toward the open back door of the truck. She catches her swollen foot on the edge of the ramp and winces. Blood trickles down. Halfway up the ramp, she pauses. The noise in the truck stops. Ruby falls silent. Slowly, Stella makes her way up the rest of the ramp. It groans under her weight, and I can tell how much she is hurting by the awkward way she moves. At the top of the incline, she stops. She pokes her trunk into the emptiness. We wait. The tiny gray trunk appears again. Shyly, it reaches out, tasting the air. Stella curls her own trunk around the babies. They make soft, rumbling sounds. We wait some more. A hush falls over the entire Big Top Mall. Thud. Thud. Step, step, pause. Step, step, pause. And there she is. So small, she can fit underneath Stella with room to spare. Her skin sags, and she sways unsteadily as she makes her way down the ramp. Not the greatest specimen, Max says, but I got her cheap from this bankrupt circus out west. They had her shipped over from Africa. Only had her a month before they went bust. He gestures toward Ruby. Thing is, people love babies. Baby elephants, baby gorillas. Heck, give me a baby alligator and I can make a killing. Stella ushers Ruby toward her domain. Mac and the two men follow. At Stella's door, Ruby hesitates. Mac gives Ruby a shove, but she doesn't budge. Doggone it, get a clue, Ruby, he mutters, but Ruby isn't moving, and neither is Stella. Mac grabs a broom. He raises it. Instantly, Stella steps in front of Ruby to shield her. Get in the cage, both of you, Mac shouts. Stella stares at Mac, considering... Gently, but firmly, using her trunk, she nudges Ruby into her domain. Only then does Stella enter. Max slams the door shut with a clang. I see two trunks intertwined. I hear Stella whispering. Poor kid, says Bob. Welcome to the Exodate Big Top Mall and Video Arcade. Home of the one and only Ivan. All right. I um, hope you guys enjoyed, and I guess we'll be hearing out hearing more about the new arrival Ruby next week. Bye.